Well, welcome back to our study. Uh, we're nearing the end. You know, we finished Corinthians. Uh, we looked at those five basic principles in the study of Romans. And, and now maybe things are getting a little clearer to you. You know, our, our family has had kind of a family tradition over the years. When we go on a family vacation, we get a, a jigsaw puzzle. As the children got older, they got bigger, more pieces. A lot of times pictures more difficult to view. And, you know, when you first open that uh, puzzle and you turn all those pieces out on the table, well, just a few uh, blotches of color on them, it's kind of hard to tell what the ultimate picture is going to look like. Now, yeah, you've got the little one on the box, but... You know, each piece you pick up and you think, I wonder where that fits or what is that telling me? And maybe you felt that way as we've studied the Word of God together. You wonder, what does that First Thessalonians piece have to do with it? Or what does that principle have? And now we've put so many of those pieces together that maybe the jigsaw puzzle is becoming more clear. And so I pray that even as we finish this study, you're going to have pretty much it assembled, okay? So why don't we ask the Lord to just inform our hearts and minds. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. It's truth without error, and we thank you that it not only informs, it transforms. May that be the case today as we study this beautiful letter from uh, the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's, let's begin, if we might, just with an understanding of, of where this Ephesian letter sets. It's one of the latter Pauline letters. He's in prison. In fact, Colossians 4.12 gives us a little bit of a setting because Epaphras, who was the leader of the church at Colossae, had found his way to Paul in prison. And as he was there, he, he shared with him some of the difficulties that the churches in Proconsula Asia were experiencing. Listen, for example, to Colossians chapter 4. He talks about Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in the will of God. And then he talks about his testimony, how he's had these great concern for that church and for all who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. Now, Laodicea, Heropolis, these churches are in, in proconsular Asia. In fact, if you look in the book of Revelation, you'll kind of get this seven church outline that, uh, that uh, kind of makes up this proconsular Asia area. We know that Paul had had a great influence on this entire area. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, talking about the Apostle Paul in verse 8, he says, He entered the synagogue, continued speaking out boldly there for three months, reasoning, persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And he and he took place for two years so that, listen, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jews and Greeks. In other words, Paul had a profound influence, not just in the churches that he had served or planted in this Asia Minor area, but, but literally in, in the entire Asia area. Now, after Epaphras comes to him and, and tells him about some of the controversies that are going on in Proconsul Asia, there's some heresies that are developing that later in the latter first and second centuries become Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And so it was a, a heretical pattern of thinking that talked about this uh, pleroma, this is a generic term, the fullness, this kind of spiritual power, this nebulous power, and, and also the fact that what man needs is, is enlightenment, not redemption. Boy, if that sounds familiar, a lot like New Age teaching, the truth of the matter is it is. Satan is not very creative. He brings the same heresy generation after generation and gives it a different name. So after Epaphras' visit, Tychicus, a messenger, is sent with a letter to Colossae, a letter to Ephesus, and a letter to Philemon because there was a runaway slave there named Onesipus, and he couldn't go through the the, the trade routes because he was a wanted slave. Now, the antidote to the heresy in Colossians 1, he takes this word pleroma, and he said, uh, if you want to experience the pleroma, he said, you must know Christ. Listen to Colossians 1.19. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the pleroma, all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile everything to Himself, having made peace by the blood of the cross. In other words, 
Paul says, listen, if you want an antidote for the heresy, look to Jesus. If you want to know the fullness, look to Jesus. It's the cross of Christ, the redemption of God. Now, in the Ephesian letter, Paul takes us a step further. Now, we can readily understand, and probably all of us would agree today, that, that Jesus, when He was on planet Earth, was the full expression of God. You agree? Well, now, Paul says that today the church is empowered to be that full expression. In fact, listen to Ephesians 1 and verse 23. It's at the end of a prayer where Paul talks about the power available to us, and he talks about what happened in the resurrection, the crucifixion, and exaltation of the Lord. In fact, in the Ephesian letter, Paul looks at Christ seated on the right hand of the Father. And so he says in verse 22, He put everything, all things, in subjection under His feet, and gave Him His head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness. There it is, the pleroma of Him who fills all in all. Now, this letter is so critical for us to understand not only our spiritual gifts, but the empowering of the church today. The context of Ephesians 4, which is our gift passage, is he's already told us that blessing that believers have been chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, and blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. That's chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. And so Paul begins a prayer in chapter 1, verse 18, that we would understand what the heritage God has in us. In other words, that we are God's chosen. We are His heritage. And God has somehow chosen to work through His human instruments, through His church. We're God's heritage. For that reason, He prays that they would know supernatural empowering, the empowering uh, that was sufficient to raise Jesus from the dead. Now, you may say, why is that so important? Well, I don't want you to miss the link, so I want to keep you in the context. Go to Ephesians 3 as we're turning towards that passage in Ephesians 4. Paul talks about his apostolic authority and his call to preach to the Gentiles. So in verse 8 of chapter 3, he says, To me, the very least of all the saints, grace was given. Told you, Paul often attached his ministry to what? Grace. There it is, charis, charismata. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is uh, the administration of the mystery which for ages have been hidden in God who created everything. Now, I don't know about you, but I love a good mystery. I, I pick up mystery novels when I travel and I read them on airplanes. My wife and I record Masterpiece Theater and we watch Sherlock Holmes together and I like a good whodunit. Well, now, if you like a mystery, here's one that has been hidden in God, the creator of everything. So here it is, verse 9 and 10, uh, or verse 10 and 11. You may want to underline it in your Bible so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which He carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow! Did you hear that? What God carried out, accomplished in Jesus Christ, His ministry on planet earth, was accomplished for the church so that the church in this generation might express the manifold wisdom of God. Now, does your church do that? <laughs> Don't you want it to? There's too much at stake for us not to do this. Now, you might ask the question, how does this happen? How, how does the church come to the place that it can express the manifold wisdom of God? Now, the answer actually is pretty simple, and it involves you. The church is empowered to express God's fullness as individual members discover their gifts and employ them in building up the body in love. Can I say it this way? You are God's love gift to His bride, the church. Wow. Have you ever thought of that? I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you as a gifted member of this body or a love gift from the Father, the exalted Lord to His bride. And that's how, when, when all the members function together, we've got the potential of, dis, of displaying this playroom, all this fullness of God. So let's go over to our passage in Ephesians 4. I just couldn't let you go to that passage without getting the context. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, 
implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. How many times have we seen this principle that every time Paul talks about the gifts, he starts talking about the community and our worthy walk in the community. He put them in that context in 1 Corinthians 13. He did so in Romans 12, 9 through 21. In other words, the context of ethical relationships in the community is vital. And so he begins by talking about walking in a manner worthy of the calling with all humility, verse 2, gentleness, patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Doesn't that sound a lot like fruit of the Spirit? Doesn't it sound a lot like 1 Corinthians 13, Romans 12, 9 through 21? Of course it does. Paul is saying these essential character traits of the Christian community are essential for the unity of the body, and the unity of the body is the platform on which spiritual gifts function properly. Verse 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, he's going to give you a bond. He's going to give you a sense of unity. Listen, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, that sevenfold unity displaces any disunity that might exist in your church. There might be disunity sometimes between generations, between uh, male and female, between uh, you know, uh, uh, black or white or Hispanic, but I don't care what differences exist, there are more things that unite us than divide us. So Paul begins with this worthy walk, showing forbearance to one another. The attitude necessary is humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, love. These are not human effort, by the way, but they're the, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. They're the gift of the Spirit. Our spiritual gifts must be used to express God's grace in and through the community to be authentic. You see, unity is the work of the Spirit. And so Paul elaborates on seven great truths that link us to one another. There may be a lot of things that could divide us, but listen to this. Here's what unites us. One body, he's talking about the church, one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Just as we all were called in one hope of our calling, in other words, the ground's pretty level at the foot of the cross, isn't it? We were all called in one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who's over all, through all, and in all. But now Paul moves but to each one. So he establishes unity. Then in verse 7, he goes to diversity, and he also goes to the individuality of believers. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, we really don't have the word charismata in this passage, but we're still talking about grace gifts. He uses the word domata, with grace, and this time he links it to the exalted Christ. He uses a quote from Psalm 68, 18. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he had also descended in the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also. He who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, the fluidity of Paul's language about gifts, by the way, should warn us about labeling one another. I hear sometimes churches say, well, that church is this kind of church, a charismatic or a neo-Pentecostal. We ought to be careful about those kind of labels. Paul is very fluid about the way he uses the language of gifts. But I want you to notice in this passage that the spiritual gifts are uniquely related to the triumphant king. Now, why do you think that's the case? He talks about he who descended and ascended are one and the same and he focuses on the ascension of the Lord. He's on the right hand of the Father now. Now, do you remember the emphasis that prompted the writing of this letter? You see, Colossians and Ephesians were written as companion letters. Uh, I think Colossians went to the church at Colossae. Uh, Ephesus started its place in Ephesus, but was probably shared with all those churches, the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the Colossian letter perhaps being shared with them. These two letters complementary, talking about some of the same principles, and so in, in the Colossian letter, you remember that he emphasized the exalted Christ as the pleroma of God. So here, he again underlines this truth to combat this heresy. You see, if Jesus is no more than another mystery religion, uh, than the church or, or mystery leader, uh, no more than one of the other 
uh, pretend gods of that day, then the church is no more than a mystery religion. Can I say that again? You see, if Jesus is not unique, if he is not the only means of redemption, if he's not the only way to God, then the church is little more than a divine country club. But Paul is saying Christ indeed is the fullness of God and the church is more than any other organization you'll belong to. It is the body of Christ. Do you, do you hear that? Do you understand that? Don't forget it. Now, how does the exalted Christ express his fullness in the world today? I'm going to underline it again. I've said it once, but you may not have heard it. He gives gifts to men and women, and in turn, he gives those gifted people to the church. Let me underline it. He gives gifts, I'm talking about spiritual gifts and abilities, to men and women, and in turn, he gives those people as his gift to the church. Now, verses 9 and 10 are important. Christ who descended has now ascended. He's exalted above all powers, including death and the grave, and he's pouring out his gifts on the church. You know what that means? We cannot afford to play church. You know, I see uh, too many people that seem to be kind of going through the motions as if church is kind of a church game. Boy, that's too much at stake for that. Jesus died for the church. He was raised for the church. He sent his Holy Spirit to unfill the church. He's coming again someday in glory to receive the church. So we cannot be uh, casual or apathetic about our involvement in the life of the church. Well, let's talk about how we're going to do this. And you're going to find some important principles here. So it uh, begins in verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, you may have noticed that in this gift list there in 4.11, he only emphasizes leadership and teaching gifts. Now, why, why do you think that's the case? Well, the truth is the heresy in this area necessitated an emphasis on doctrinal stability. Uh, we will also notice that He's going to underline this when gifts function properly, doctrinal stability will be established. Now, what does that tell us again? It tells us that no list is intended to be comprehensive. Each list is tailored to the needs of the moment. And so we get some new gifts here again. Evangelist, pastor, teacher are new gifts. You know what I'm convinced? Had Paul written on this subject several more times, he may have felt at liberty to add even more gifts. The point is, God uniquely gifts His church in every generation. Now, you know what that means? There is no reason for us to think that there would not be new gifts available to the church today. There are new issues we face, issues of technology, issues of global missions. We have opportunities we didn't have in the first century, and so why would the creative God of the universe not gift His church to accomplish every task in every generation? Well, the answer is He would. Now, let's look in this one, the results of gifted ministry. You want to do that? He says it builds up the body of Christ. So the gifted pastor teacher equips the gifted saints to do the work of service. Uh, oh, I probably ought to stop on that one. Pastor teacher doesn't do the work of service. They are involved in the work of service according to their gifts, but they equip and teach others. You know what that means? Your church has as many ministers as you have members. Every member of the church is a minister. Now what happens? Build up the body of Christ. There we got the word edify again. That's where we've been on spiritual gifts the whole time, isn't it? Now he gives us a goal, both short term and long term, until we all attain to unity. Unity was a given of the Holy Spirit, but unity is also maintained and fostered as all the members work together. So that which the Holy Spirit desires, he accomplishes through the members working together. And so he says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness, what's that? That pleroma of Christ. Now, isn't that exciting? The short and long-term goals of gifted ministries, building up the body of Christ, the specifics in here, attain to the unity of the faith, full measure of spiritual maturity, and that means that we will experience and become that fullness of Christ in our world today the way Jesus was in His day. Is that exciting? 
Well, it is, and it has some practical results. As a result, verse 14, we are no longer like children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. You see, I told you, heresy was an issue in that day, as it is in our day. He says, now what happens when all the members get involved, when they apply their gifts in the place they are, they get uh, immersed in the life of the church, then what happens, God builds them up in unity and the knowledge of the Son of God so that doctrinal stability is ensured because they won't be tossed all over the place. I love that. How's that happen? 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every aspect unto Him who is the head, even Christ. So now we begin to grow as we speak the truth in love, uh, as we uh, minister to one another, as we edify one another. So we begin to see that this church is growing up to the measured, to the stature that's measured by the very fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ is gift, goal, blessing, and calling. God provides His fullness to the church through the gifting of His members whose gifted service enables the church to express God's fullness in the world today. Isn't that a neat concept? Well, listen to this last verse. From whom, that's Christ, the head Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body so that it builds itself in love. Did you notice the proper working of what? Each individual part. Well, let me kind of pull this together. Number one, the church is empowered to grow because Christ, the triumphant King, fills it. He fills it with Himself. How does He do that? He fills it with gifted members that He Himself has empowered. Number two, although the growth comes from God, every body member is involved in the growth process. That's what He says, which every joint supplies. Verse 16, each individual part. Now, some commentators suggest that there's a little confusion biologically here that the joint doesn't supply anything. It's not what the text says. So the head supplies the energy. The joint applies the energy. Now, I, I don't know if you know much about a, a lever and a fulcrum, but, but it's the same image there. Now, the, the muscle of my arm may, may move it, but it's conveyed through that, uh, that joint, isn't it? If that joint, what happens if you get a tennis elbow or a pitcher throws his shoulder out and, and that joint is, is, is out of joint, then the muscle can't supply or move the energy where it's necessary. Now listen to this one. The muscle power of ministry on planet Earth is the Holy Spirit. But the gifted member is the joint by which the power of the Holy Spirit is focused and applied to earthly tasks. Can I say that again? The muscle power for ministry is the Holy Spirit. But how does the Holy Spirit work on planet Earth? You know, we pray, say, come Holy Spirit. We sing about that. We ask the Holy Spirit to accomplish things in our life and in our church. How does the Holy Spirit accomplish things in the world today? The answer is you. You are the part through whom the Spirit of God works. And, and you are literally that joint or that lever through which His ministry and power are applied. Thirdly, the unity of the Spirit is necessary for diversely gifted members to work together for the common goal. Finally, the proper implementation of the gifts must take place in the context of love. How many times have we said that? How many times has Paul said it? You see, if there's not unity in the body, if there's not love for one another, how do these gifts function? Well, I'm going to tell you, we're right now at the place where you've got all the, all the foundation, all the Bible studies behind you. These are the major passages on spiritual gifts. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to look about why we need to discover them and how we can discover them. Would you pray to that end? Would you study to that end? In just a moment, you're going to start filling in some blanks and get some more of this and, and, and apply these things. So let me pray for you and for your small group leader. Father, thank you that uh, these students have been so diligent to uh, study your word. Now, I pray for the small group leader this morning as they lead this process of not only learning, but but uh, exploring the way this Word can become real in our lives, in our church, in our small groups. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know you're looking forward to the next two weeks. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you.